Okay, so I know I say this a lot, but I'm going to try to keep this one short. Um, I know I always say that, and that's always my intention, and then I tend to think of other things as I'm discussing it. But on this one, um, I just want to quickly address the idea of maximum recoverable volume versus minimum effective dose. Uh, because a lot of people have taken my comments out of context. Uh, I did a podcast once where I discussed this, and um, some people got really upset. I got a lot of hate mail. I got really nasty messages from people thinking that I somehow have an issue with Mike Isretel. I don't. Uh, Mike is a really nice guy. I've interacted with him on multiple occasions. I actually think he's really funny, and I um, I like him. Like, I like him as a person, even. I mean, I don't care if he... Um, lifts weights or not it's like he's he's a funny guy and um like i think he has a good personality so like i don't have anything against him when i talk about maximum recoverable volume um and and i'm sure mike would not disagree on this um i don't believe that that is a good strategy for in-season athletes and i don't think mike would disagree on that uh, in fact, Mike tends to talk about it in terms of bodybuilding, which, you know, bodybuilding is bodybuilding. Uh, you don't have to perform on Sunday or Saturday if you're a college athlete. Uh, but the point being, you know, like, if you think about these things logically, if you're in your off-season, go ahead. Like, do maximum recoverable volume. Um, but, like, if you're in-season, you shouldn't be... Like, in-season really isn't a good time for you to be trying to gain anything. It's basically try to maintain your level of strength, maintain your level of fitness, and show up fresh for the game because you never know if a game's going to go into overtime or, you know, like you can end up sitting the bench a whole game or you can end up being in every single play for a whole game. Um, you know, I played hockey. Uh, there were games where I was on the ice nonstop because uh, my coaches all thought that I was the greatest penalty kill uh, player ever because I'm dumb and I would step in front of the, the puck uh, so that the goalie didn't have to make the save. And so... You know, we played a box, and uh, and I would dive in front of every shot and let the puck hit me, because I'm dumb like that. Um, the thing is, you know, we could have a game where we took a lot of penalties, and I might get 30 minutes a game. I mean, that's that's like that's not something that never happened. That's not common, but it did happen from time to time. Or we'd have a game that would go into overtime. So, uh, you know, that's one of those things, like. If you're in season, you shouldn't be wearing yourself out in the gym or training super hard. You need to be fresh for the game. Uh, so there's my first part of this whole maximum recoverable volume versus minimum effective dose. And then the second part of this, I really should do like a graph or a chart, but basically picture like an upside down V. At one end of the V, right, at one end of this whole thing, you have minimum effective dose. On the other side, you have maximum recoverable volume. As you progress, over time, you move up this V to the point where you're now at the point of the V, right? Where the two lines intersect, okay? You're so advanced, you're elite, you know, you're, you're an Olympian or something. Your minimum effective dose is basically the same as your maximum recoverable volume, right? For a beginner, they can do very, very little and they will make progress. So their minimum effective dose might be three sets of 10 with 95 pounds, but their maximum recoverable volume could be 10 sets of 10 with 95 pounds, right? So they can do three sets and make progress, but they're capable of recovering from 10 sets of 10 because they're only lifting 95 pounds. So this isn't like this puts a massive strain on their body. However, now you're squatting 1,000 pounds. It's very hard to recover from squatting 1,000 pounds, even if you do it for a single. Like, it'll... That's a thousand pounds. I mean, just walking out a thousand pounds, the stress on your body, and now you're going to squat it. Holy cow. You know, Chris Duffin squatting it for reps, right? Whew, man. But at the same time, you're at such an advanced level that you don't have a minimum effective dose anymore where you could come in and just do, you know, I don't know, three singles at 500 or something and make progress. Like when you're squatting a thousand pounds, your minimum effective dose is probably squatting something close to a thousand pounds for you to be able to move the needle any higher, right? For you to make progress. So now your minimum effective dose is actually very close to your maximum recoverable volume because you're at such an advanced level, okay? So there's two parts to this. One is that um, 
in season, you should be training minimally because you should be doing just as much as you need to do to maintain your attributes during the season uh, because your primary goal is playing your sport, not lifting weights in the gym. There's no barbell on the, on the football field. The other part of this is that as you become more and more advanced, your maximum recoverable volume and your minimum effective dose will get closer and closer, right? It's like the difference between the effective dose and the lethal dose. Um, at some point, like, you're going to need to take so much to have an effect that you're going to come very close to the lethal dose. I'm trying to make an analogy to medications and things like that, but the reality is that uh, training is not terribly different than dosing a medication. You need to train X amount in order to get an effect. And at some point, you're going to have to keep increasing that dosage to such a level where it's going to be very difficult for you to recover. So I hope that makes sense. Um, like I said, I probably should have drawn a graph or something like that for this, but I, I'm sure you guys can just picture an upside down V and picture the fact that at the bottom of this whole thing, that's beginner level. And at the top of this thing, you've got the elite level. And as you become more advanced, your the difference between your minimum effective dose and your maximum recoverable volume that gets closer and closer together till at some point you're basically like, I have to come in and squat a thousand pounds for a single. That's my minimum effective dose. Plus also that's the most work I can possibly do and still recover. So I hope that makes sense. Um, if Mike sees this video, by all means, Mike, go ahead and comment below and let people know if you disagree with this. I get the impression from our interactions on Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that that you wouldn't disagree with this. Um, I, I don't think I've said anything uh, that goes against um, what we've discussed. You know, this is one of those things where it's contextual. I'm not for or against maximum recoverable volume. It's not like I have a problem with it. Like, oh, don't, don't ever do it. Um, at the same time, it's like training to failure. Like, I'm not against training to failure, but like, shit, like, you don't need to be training to failure every single workout, especially not in season, right? So it's, it's all about using these things intelligently and timing them appropriately uh, so that you're not flattening yourself in the middle of the season. Uh, but by all means, like, go ahead and kick your ass in the off season. I mean, like, you can take days off in the off season and let yourself recover. It's the, it's the whole point of periodization, which, you know, um, I mean, that's a different topic. I'll save that for a different video talking about periodization, but... I'm sure you guys can understand this concept that there are, is a time and place for each of them. You know, there's a time and place for you to maintain, and there's a time and a place for you to put your put, foot on the gas pedal and go as hard as you possibly can. Um, and that's one of those things where, like, I don't know. I don't want to tell you you have to have a coach for it because you don't. Like, if you're really disciplined and you're very objective about yourself, then by all means, go for it. Like, you can probably manage it yourself, but for a lot of people, they need a coach to tell them when to pull back. I, d I find that people don't need coaches to push them, uh, especially high-level athletes. High-level athletes will push themselves. Most people need a coach simply to pull them back. And, um, you know, I think a coach can be very helpful in helping someone to recognize when it's time for you to put your foot on the gas or let your foot off and maybe just do some minimum effective dose so you can maintain your attributes uh, while still being fresh for your sport. So that's all. Um, and like I said, this is specific to sport. I'm not talking about bodybuilders. I'm not talking about even power lifters for that matter. I, I mean like field sport athletes. Um, like there's no barbell on the ice. There's no barbell on the football field. There's no barbell on the baseball diamond, right? Um, for power lifters, I mean, obviously your sport is the barbell. Weightlifters, your sport is the barbell. And, you know, for bodybuilders, I suppose your sport isn't the barbell, but really, like, it's not the one day you step on stage that's, that's your sport. For bodybuilders, it's the other 364 days of the year. That's, that's really what matters. You happen to step on stage, and that seems like that's the day of your sport, but really, your sport is the 364 days that you had to work your ass off in order to step on stage for that one day. So, and yes, I am giving bodybuilders credit and calling bodybuilding a sport, um, which I'm sure some people disagree with, but I don't know. I'm cool with anyone that likes to lift weights. 